Well, Ian, uh, first of all, how do you reflect on your time as North Mallet manager? Yeah, I think, you know, I've had a few months now to, to think about things. You, uh, for me, I've, I've looked at it over the whole period, five and a half years from taking on the under-21s job and, and you know, the, the, the three-year period that that encapsulated and then two and a half years with, with the senior team. It, for me, a lot of it was about development of young players, certainly. The under-21 speaks for itself, but having took that job over when I did, um, you know, they hadn't had a, uh, an away win for eight years or a home win for six years. So it was a, a job that you know, completely needed re rebuilding young players to be brought through, given the, the experience of international football and given them the confidence to go and achieve results that they did and, and you know, the likes of competing with Spain and, uh, and Slovakia at that, that time, you know, we, we were bottom seeds in, in, in the group and we managed to you know, get a, a famous victory in Spain over a very, very good Spanish side um, and come, come second behind them and, and, and you know, narrowly miss out on, uh, on, on, on goal, goal difference for you know, to claim a, a playoff place. But, um, you know, eventually that then goes into being given a chance when Michael moved on into the senior team. But again, it was a rebuilding job and, and bringing young players through and, and giving them experience. And, you know, the, the 14, 13, 14, you know, new caps, debuts that I gave to, to players, you know, a lot of it was fact-finding mission, you know, even when we were in the World Cup campaign. So you know, a lot to look back on, a lot to reflect on, a lot of good times. Real, real enjoyable times as well. Met some fantastic people, worked alongside some great people, and the players you know, love playing for, for their country, and, and hopefully we, we enhance that. How do you look back on, I guess, how it ended and how much disappointment was there there? Yeah, I felt as though it was cut short. Um, you know, my, in my mind, the time, my time wasn't done. You know, I had one World Cup campaign, so to be compared to anybody you know, compared against anybody, you know, is, is unfair really, I think, in my mind. You know, I was told that you, you're judged on World Cups and Euro campaigns. Um, you know, looking back at the World Cup campaign, we came third to obviously the European champions at the time in Italy and a team that were to in top 10 of Europe in, in Switzerland. So, you know, and you had to, you had to come top to qualify by rights. And uh, so it was very, very difficult, but say to, to look back at that campaign, not conceding a goal at, at home, you know, the only team in qualifying campaign not to concede a goal, um, but w was great for, for, you know, a team that was still building, very young, very inexperienced, alongside some, you know, some great senior role models. And, and it was a case of building for, for that next Euros campaign, which um, will obviously be up and coming and starting in March. You talked about not conceding a goal at home in that campaign. You look at that, I suppose the standout, that draw at home against the, the newly crowned European champions Italy on another night. Yeah. Northern Ireland could have won that when you think of those kind of second half clear cut chances in particular. Are those the kind of fine margins in, in big games like that? But did that yeah. give you a kind of belief that things were going in the right direction at, at kind of that point? Well, it told me something, you know, going into that campaign that, that you know, Northern Ireland really still haven't had a massive uh, result against a, one of the bigger nations, so-called bigger nations. So to come up against a, a Switzerland and Italy and going so close, for us there was nothing on the game really, apart from pride and, and obviously personal satisfaction in players and, and, and staff as a whole. And, and you know, we, like you say, we had the three best chances in the game. All right, Italy had a lot of the possession. But I remember looking back at that game and thinking how we prepared for it how we were, knew we were coming up against a team that were going to attack us. They had to beat us to stand any qualification to, to, to get to the World Cup by rights for them to, to beat Switzerland. So there was so much on the game for, for Italy. And speaking to um, the, the late Gianluca Viali after the game, and, and he, you know, he texted me after as well and, and said, look, you played a great game. You, you, you almost defended like the Italians did. <laughs> back in the day and, and, and for me I took that as a great compliment. One, the way we'd set up, the way we'd work with the players, the way the players went and uh, put that game plan to, 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 to feature in, in, in the game but also create chances as well uh, and that told me that we were on the right pathway. So, you know, yes, for it to come to an end after a Nations League campaign which was obviously disappointing results but for, for me and for a lot of people it was still a, you know, a development 
period. And um, you know, I'd, I'd just signed a new contract as well, uh, and, and it was all about preparing for for the next uh, for the next campaign, which was the Euros. And and uh, you know, to go to the draw, to see the draw, to get a favourable draw, you know, from a pot five team. You know, I think you know Northern Ireland fans will be hopeful that they can get out of that group and, and, and qualify for the Euros by right. So not to get the chance to, to take that team and to see how far we'd come is, uh, was, was a disappointment, yeah. What do you think ultimately kind of went, you sort of fast forward on from that moment of Italy and you see progress and you're feeling confident. When you fast forward on through the Nations League, yeah. what do you feel went against you towards the end? Was it the kind of Nations League results? Was it the fact that the draw was kind of Michael O'Neill, who had had such a successful time beforehand, became available? Was it a combination of all of that, or what were you told? It's difficult for me to answer that one, to be honest. Yeah. Um, after the draw, I, I knew after the June games, the four games where you know, we had uh, 11 <coughs> players, 12 players unavailable. Now, some players deem the Nations League, and I can, I can say it. You know, hand on heart, they, they look at it as glorified friendlies, and some, you know, quite rightly, some players need a rest, especially after the period they'd had during COVID. The amount of pressure on the body that, that players were put under during that COVID period, you know, that was, if you remember, that was the only thing that was happening really for people to be, you know, watching games on TV. Players were still playing under the restrictions that they were. You know, you were in a bubble. You couldn't move out of your hotel. You couldn't go and see other members of your family. Uh, and that, that was difficult for, for, for players, staff alike, and to manage that during p that period was, was challenging, I have to say. And, and certainly those that were doing it on a day-to-day -day basis for the six, seven months you know, in club football must have been horrendous. And, and speaking to people after that, yeah, they look back at it saying, how do we get through it? But um, you know, that, that was something where we'd come out of that period, still needed arrest players were fatigued fortunately we had Johnny and Davo still in this because they'd had major injuries towards the back end of that last season so they were were in the side but the likes of Craig said Craig Cathcart you know he needed a rest um, so you know I'm sure he'll be back for for the Euros but it, it, you know it's one of those where you have to take the the players thoughts into consideration and I've always I've always tried to do that for for definite so yeah, I, I knew that the results weren't good enough in June, those four games in isolation, but I'd, I'd spoken, to, I was always in conversation with, with Patrick Nelson and, and you know the superiors at, at the IFA, and, and they said, yeah, results need to, to improve. And we beat Kosovo at home, came back from, from being a, a goal down and 2-1 and, and down to, you know, to, to win that game 3-2, showed that the players were playing very much for, for you know, what we were trying to do. They're invested in what we were doing, and, and any team would find it difficult going away to, away to Greece. So, you know, having having had that time to reflect on that, yeah, I feel I feel, you know, a little hard done by. But um, hey, I understand that that, you know, they have to make a decision. We got a favourable draw, and Michael was available, so they, they obviously feel that, you know, that was the way that they wanted to go, and and, you know, that's that's their prerogative. Do you feel you're a better manager for the experience? Yeah, absolutely, definitely. You know, you have to deal with things. One, you know, leading up to a game is so d different. You can't work with the players for, for weeks on end to get ready for, you know, a, bar a barrage of, of, of two or three games. You've got them in on the Sunday at best, Sunday night at best. Monday, coming through for maybe you're preparing for a Thursday game. How do they come out of the weekend games? So you've got to wait for the... Uh, for the assessment from the medical staff to see whether they can actually train, whether they're leading up to a game. You've certainly got players that you know you want in your team. So it might be a case of they walk through things in training. Um, I was fortunate. I had top, top players that knew how to look after their bodies and also could take on information not, without necessarily going into it in depth on the pitch for two or three days. So we could do things in the, in the, the meeting room. Or on a one-to-one, -one. but um, you know, a lot of the time you're working with younger players, haven't been in that environment, and you're trying to get them, you know, feeling comfortable within that environment, letting them know that they are good enough to be here, you know, and and, and you're talking young players as young as 17 years of age that's you know haven't even played a, a first team game at their club, let alone international first team level. So you know, for the likes of a Connor Bradley, Shea Charles. Uh, even you know more, I suppose, older players that that you know 
probably the fans consider to be embedded now in the squad, like an Ali McCann or a, a Daniel Ballard. You know, they're, they're still young, and they're deemed now as being because you know, they've been given that experience because they've applied themselves so well, and, and, and you know they've, they've had that time with the, the senior ones to, to, to feel part of it. So you mentioned the young players. I, I just I'm interested to hear the insight into how much. I guess bravery that takes as a manager because a, a big part of your brief, if I'm, I'm right in saying that, was to develop these young players. You do think of people like Connor Bradley, Shea Charles, but I guess one aspect that's quite unique to the Northern Ireland job is also the worry that younger players are tempted to go and play for the Republic of Ireland. And how, how did you find dealing with that and not only sort of progressing these young players as footballers, but maybe yeah. also having to work at them and show them that this was the right way forward and the right pathway to, to choose Northern Ireland? Yeah, it's always been b before me. It was always a, a, you know, a challenge to, to compete with the Republic of Ireland for young players. And um, you know, I think there was a, a real surge in, in, uh, in the recruitment from down south. And I knew, we, we knew you know, at the time that I was coming in there were certain players that, that they were targeting. There were certain players that they were looking to, to bring into to their their, their academy, if, if you like, their fold. Um, so for, for the likes of, uh, of a Connor Bradley to go and get a Charlie McCann, to bring Paddy Lane into the fold, Shea Charles, you know, I, kn I knew that they, they were all over these players. And, so what's um, your approach to, to players well, like that? For me, it was, it was talking to their, their families, talking to the players themselves, talking to the clubs that they were at, um, telling them that, 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 you know, encouraging that the pathway through for, for us was, was certainly the way we were going was giving younger players a chance if they were good enough, if they showed the, the potential that they would be given a chance and I think we were true to our word on that. It wasn't a case of just giving them caps to tie them down. You know, the likes of Connor Bradley, um, you know, Shea Charles, as I've said, uh, Charlie McCann, you know, never got a start under me but he, was, he could see that, you know, these players were given that opportunity. Paddy Lane coming out of non-league football but he could have gone to a, a Wales, England, Republic or Northern Ireland and, and you know I spoke to his family uh, quite a few times actually and, and, and explained look this is how we value him, this is where we see him, this is how we see him progressing through and he probably came through earlier than what, what he expected actually. Um, so you know it's, it's a case of having those conversations, speaking with um, integrity and, and, and you know showing them that, that look giving them no promises but with their, you know, with their, um, I think, knowledge and, and, and skills that they were building through and, and, you know, their professionalism, they would be given a chance and, and, and we did that. Speaking about Bradley and Charles in particular, because Shea Charles was on the bench for Manchester City in, mm -hmm. in the knockout stages of the Champions League this week. Connor Bradley, of course, still a Liverpool player, but on loan at Bolton, doing very well. What would you say to, I guess, fans of Liverpool and Manchester City about those two players and, and their future prospects. Could they, you know, could they do it at, at that top level, that Premier League level, or is it difficult to, to say at kind of this age? Well, it, it is going to be very difficult for them, for sure, mm -hmm. to to feature for a Liverpool or a Man City regularly. But they're on the right pathway, you know, and they're doing it in two separate separate ways at the moment. Man City have kept Shea Charles within house and and still playing within the twenty ones and obviously training every day with with Pep and the first team and, and progressing that way, which is fantastic. What, what an education for a young player to learn from what I consider to be the best, best, best coach on, on, on the planet at this moment in time. Um, and and <laughs> probably quite hard, a bit harsh, a bit Jurgen Klopp, maybe the second best. I don't, I don't, <laughs> know. I don't know how, how people will feel about that. But <laughs> Conor Bradley's gone out having been with the first team, had a few games in cup games for Liverpool. Now he's in, he's in the, uh, the Football League playing with, with Bolton uh, I spoke to Connor and, and Connor's family about that move and, and what that would what challenges it would give but it's a good club for him to, to learn his trade and play in men's football and you know they're the sort of things that I felt was the right thing to do for the player for their families for the club for, you know for, for Northern Ireland as well going forward and Connor's like you say ripping it up for week in week out being very very uh, very good reports coming back. I've seen him several times and, and has, has shown that he's, he's capable of, of stepping up to the next level, whatever that might be. Let's go back to early on in your reign as, as Northern Ireland manager, there was that high of the Bosnia win and 
the penalty shootout drama and getting to that final and and then obviously the disappointment of a final that even though it was at Windsor Park Northern Ireland suffered from not having any fans in the ground that's usually what what helps that Windsor Park experience yeah. how do you look back on on kind of those bittersweet moments those bittersweet games yeah two, two very different emotions because you very early on into into Moraine as you say um, you know, we, we had a, a five days building into that Bosnia game so it was very clear for us the plan as to what we could do what we wanted to do with the players um, knowing that if it you know went to penalties that you know we, we would have to be very very prepared for that I'm not one of these that, that will leave it to the players you know at the end of extra time uh, and you know then pick the five best players that we thought you know as you could see at that time you know I think we made some big calls and and to, to bring Boise and Connor Washington yeah. off the bench with two minutes to go and actually I was I think I've said I was scared that the, the ball wouldn't go out of play actually <laughs> uh, you know you you screwed they're ready I think they were stood there for about two minutes on the sideline uh, would they get a touch of the ball before actually you know being able to take the penalty um, big call and and ones you have to get right otherwise it can it can turn around and, and really be thrown back in your face and and fortunately you know the players were, were fantastic on the night we went down a goal we talked about going down a goal um, you know the, the the response was fantastic Niall McGinn popping up with a, an important goal as he, as, as he has done throughout his career and carried on doing that you know it's um, you know it was great for one of those players under me to, to, to realize that they've still got a part to play you know of course people talk about Johnny Evans Stephen Davis Stuart Dallas but someone like Niall McGinn has probably gone under the radar at times, but he, he was fantastic for me. And, and so you don't forget things like that and, and you know, got us back into the game. Um, we perhaps could have won it in, in normal time, but didn't. Went to extra time uh, and making the changes that we wanted to. You know, it worked out fantastically well. Uh, the prepar say the preparation we'd done for that, you know, not just me, my staff, um, you know, in building up for, for certain scenarios. I remember Steve Harper <laughs> getting yellow and red cards, actually ready to hold up for Bailey. Bailey had writing on his on his water bottle. They, you know, the goalkeeping department had gone through their situation. You know, the, the takers knew who they were going to take because we'd worked out and worked with them. What's your best penalty? Who's the strongest takers? Who's going to be on the pitch? And um, you know, that that takes time. That takes effort. That, uh, and, and say from staff and players alike. It was fantastic. So to get the win, great. But there was still another game to go, uh, and one that we, you know, we felt capable enough to go and win it. What people probably don't factor in is what you've mentioned: yeah. is the Windsor Park crowd. Yeah. If it was a full house, I think we go on and win that game when we get the equaliser. Um, we didn't perform probably as well as what we we could have done on the night. And again, I, I still put that down to a, a COVID factor. They had players that were playing regular games abroad. I think on the continent they were playing a lot more, a lot earlier than what we were, and with crowds, um, you know, we we were still sort of bitting and bobbing. I think, as a, as, a, as a nation, going into that game, but you know, again, we fell behind. We came back. We got an equaliser, for well deserved equaliser, and we're on top. And I, I just felt, you know, going into into it, I thought we were, we would have uh, we would have gone on to to win the game. And when we hit the post. With, with Laff, I remember that would have been the perfect scenario for him, where his family was at that time as well, um, and, and what, what they were going through. And, you know, I thought the stars were, were going to align. But on that night, it didn't happen for us. And, and say it takes a, uh, a mistake from us or, or a, a bit of good fortune. I think, you know, one of the, I don't know whether it was Flam that jumped out from the, the back four and, and, and tried to win a ball wasn't able to, then I think there were two on two and it, and it came, it went in off, off Johnny's backside, I think, uh, and wrong footed the goalkeeper. And, and, you know, you talk about fine margins, you know, we could have been going to a Euros, you know, within my first three or four games. A, a question, I suppose, for any manager who moves on from a club or association, any regrets, anything you would have done differently? No, nope. no, nope. the, the way, you know, the pathway that we're on, mm -hmm. uh, what we talked about, how we'd worked, you know, whether it was from the underage groups, the levels, you know, working with, with Jared Little at 17s, 19s, working with John Schofield at the under-21s, uh, working with Andy Waterworth, the academy. Everyone was aligned. We, we knew where we were going. We knew what we wanted to do and what we needed to do. 
whether that was in recruitment, whether that was bringing younger players and fast tracking them to the next level, whatever level that was. Um, and, and you know, that's that's where we were going. And, and you know, I knew that I at times I had to take a hit in, in results to try and get players the experience needed to eventually bring Northern Irish football back for a chance to go and, uh, and, and qualify for a major tournament. Um, and again, being told that that's what you're going to be judged on, your qualifications, World Cups, Euros. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's probably where, you know, I'll, I'll be ranked alongside the other Northern Ireland managers, but for me, maybe that's, uh, there's not a, a bit of fairness in that because uh, at this moment in time, you know, my record was exactly the same as what Michael's was at this stage, mm. for instance. So it's very, very difficult to, to compare, you know, what would have been or what could have been. No one will know. Will you be able to kind of look at, uh, I guess, when now Michael's back in charge, will you be able to look on and look out for the team and the players in, in March for the opening two games? Will that be difficult to, to do, given the, uh, you, know, you thought you moved on earlier than you thought? Difficult to say, because I, 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 I love how I was received in Northern Ireland. I love the Northern Irish public. I love the, the, the people. I love the, the football. I love what they stand for. They enjoy life. They enjoy you know, their sport, whatever it might be. They want the team to win. Uh, and I, and I, I genuinely felt I, I feel Northern Irish. There's a part of me that feels Northern Irish. Did you pick up any Northern uh, Irishisms? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably not the ones I can say in this interview. Yeah. But, uh, but no, no look, look, I didn't try and take um, some of those Northern Irish traits out of the players or staff. We, you know, we enjoyed the wins and, and we, we worked very, very hard at the right times to, to, to get better. And uh, of course I want them to do well. Of course I do. But, you know, there'll be a part of me that, that um, you know, in, in March I'm sure will, 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 will hurt because you want to be there. I know what it's like. You know, when you go into a, a campaign, you get together for a, a, for, as a squad, you know, you love meeting the lads when they came in. You love seeing the staff, smiles on their faces, uh, enjoying what they were doing. And, and, you know, I wanted to be part of that. But, you know, that chapter's now closed and I have to move on and, 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 and I, I am doing. And there's a, a lot more things that I want to go and achieve. What is next for you? Well, um, <laughs> I'm going to do a bit, bit of education as well. I've, I've, I've not studied for something for quite a while. Um, the last thing was my LMA diploma. Uh, did that come before my pro life? I'm not sure, but I, I've always wanted to learn and what's next and what's what's new. Um, so I'm going to take on a, a master's degree in uh, sporting directorship. Uh, that's something that interests me later on down the line, I think. But um, definitely, you know, prepare for something early. Um, so that's that's going to be a challenge. But I, I want to get back into club football, and and it's something that I, I think I can again build you know, a young squad, work with young players. A lot of clubs now are, are, are working within the academies and trying to bring in young players, whether it's from you know, their home, hometown or from you know, other clubs and recruiting. Uh, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm good at that. I know I can work with young players, give them the confidence, you know, work with them day in, day out um, to, to unify them and to put them on the right pathway. Uh, and build teams, and, and for me, that's something that I see is, is a massive strength of mine. Do you have any preference of you? You mentioned club football. There is it, is it club? Would you consider international? Would Would you consider jobs abroad? Is it domestic football here in the UK? What, what? Yeah, primarily, I've, I've looked at, at, at club football, and I've spoken to a few chairmen and, and chief execs uh, since being out. But um, something's you know it's not been quite right at the time, and uh, so. That, that does interest me, but I've got no divine right of getting in at any level. I've got no perceived level to say, no, I'm not going any lower than that. So for me, if it's the, the right club at the right time, with the right people that, that you know you feel that would give you a, enough time to, to, to work with a squad, build a squad, you know, you maybe get a couple of transfer windows mm -hmm. to be able to do that, which is so important now. I see managers you know, not being given enough time at all working with other managers, players, or, you know, whether the, 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 the appointment doesn't align with what's already in the club or what the club ethos is at that time, I just feel as though that, that's, that's very, very difficult to turn that ship around straight away and maintain it. Uh, and, and, and you see clubs making a change after eight or nine weeks, you know, 10 games, 12 games. That's not, that's not necessarily enough time. 
but um, you know I understand the constraints that clubs feel that they're under. They can't lose that level that they're in. Um, but for me, I, I've, I've looked. You know, I'm more than open to 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 other things, whether it's abroad, whether it is another international gig. Uh, I know that I've got, I've got you know a vast amount of experience in all forms now. You know, I've won things in, in club football, whether it's titles, cups, promotions, uh, and I've saved clubs from from relegation as well since being there. So so you know. I feel as though I've built up a, a great experience, pool of experience, and, and uh, I'm, I'm better at my job now than what I was five and a half years ago. And you mentioned earlier the pro licence, probably one thing they don't teach you in the pro licence, I don't know, maybe you'll tell us, but the, they expect the unexpected moments in yeah. football, and I suppose you had a couple of those in the, during your time, I think, you think back especially to that yeah. moment with Kyle Lafferty and then Conor McMenamin. Yeah. Uh, how, how, how difficult was it to kind of deal with the, the, the kind of the fallout of the McMenamin situation? Is, is, that a, is that a big problem? Is that just an extra thing managers have to think about these days? Historic social media posts and all this kind of thing? Yeah. And social media in general? It is becoming more and more prevalent nowadays. Um, uh, and social media can be, a, it can be a help, for sure. Promotes people, promotes what you're doing as a club. Um, but it can be a hindrance and, and you know it can throw up things historically that you you know you weren't expecting and certainly you talk about Conor McMenamin you know to pull him into my room that day you know literally half an hour before leaving the team hotel um, forgetting Conor McMenamin is what 26 27 at the time and, and you know I'd give him his debut probably didn't expect it but had done great things in, in the Irish League deserved his chance in the squad and, and did well when he came in and you know to be pulled out of that game against Kosovo at the last minute you know it was heartbreaking for, for him I know what it meant to him uh, it was a difficult conversation for me to have but you, you have to do I think the right thing at the right time um, and, and you know at that time we were unsure as to where it was where it had come from and what what sort of period it was and, and um, the connotations it would have so to do that and to have those conversations yeah it's all part and parcel of what you do you're, you're I've said you have to have many facets as a, as a, as a leader, as a head coach, as a manager. Um, you know, you are a, a teacher. You are a, someone who, who has to be a father figure. You have to be a, a social worker. And, um, you know, you have to be ready for those, those times. And, and, you know, I think looking back at it, I think we got more right than what we did wrong. And, and you know, again, you're better for, for those experiences. And I'm a better, better person for it.